Hello, everybody. <coughs> My name is George Sesney, and this is the fall vegetable gardening presentation uh, from the North Fulton Master Gardeners. Am I live now? Okay. Hello. My name is George Sesney. Uh, I'm a master gardener for North Fulton County Master Gardeners and the Master Gardener Association of the State of Georgia. Uh, welcome to our fall vegetable gardening presentation. <clears throat> a little bit about myself. I've been a master gardener for 12 years, but I've been vegetable gardening for probably 60. I started when I was very young. Uh, my dad had a garden when we were very young and that was where we learned to plant things and harvest and have all those wonderful, veg wonderful vegetables we're gonna talk about today. I moved here in 1976. <clears throat> so I've been a gardener in the state of Georgia since then. And once I retired in 2007, I spent a lot of time doing uh, volunteer work and community gardens where I support uh, local food banks by growing vegetables that they need. Uh, many of the food banks don't have a source of fresh vegetables. Most of what they get is canned or end of shelf life uh, stuff from supermarkets. So they welcome all the fresh vegetables that they can get. Uh, we're gonna talk about <clears throat> vegetable gardening in the state of Georgia. Um, and you see this agenda that we have here, it's fairly straightforward. One thing I, I want to mention, um, this broadcast goes out to a lot of people and you may not live in Georgia or even in the Southeast. What I am talking about here basically applies to North Georgia when I talk about things like frost dates of soil, uh, things that are specific to the part of Georgia. If you are not living in the state of Georgia, you might wanna check with your local state cooperative extension office to find out things like frost dates or the kinds of soil preparation you need in your area. Um, <clears throat> but most of what I say here today will be applicable to uh, most locales. You can, see, you can see from the agenda, we're gonna talk about some sustainable gardening, the difference between fall and winter plant, or spring plantings, uh, maintenance, disease management. Uh, basically the approach that I take is a kind of a holistic uh, approach where everything is sustainable with minimal use of chemicals. And we'll talk about that more as we get into the conversation as to why I think it's the way to go and why it's best for your garden. Okay, conventional <clears throat> versus organic gardening. Um, there are two different philosophies basically, <clears throat> and you can combine them into what we call sustainable gardening, which takes the best of both. Uh, and it really depends on your individual garden, uh, your individual talents, uh, the amount of time you can put into your garden and the uh, individual problems you have with your garden. Conventional is a kind of what I call uh, <clears throat> commercial gardening or, or you know, um, industrial gardening. Uh, organic is more you know, local small farm gardening, truck farm gardening, uh, things that you see at your local farmer's market. But what, what we're trying to do with sustainable gardening is to combine the best of both of those things. And you can see that little a triple circle on your screen. You wanna take care of the environment, you wanna take care of the needs of, of society, which is basically to produce good, healthy food. Uh, and then you wanna obviously be able to make some money uh, or make it worth your while to do, have this garden at home. So where all of those things intersect, that's where you're basically trying to be all things to all people. And when you do it right, that's sustainable. Sustainable talks about many things in that definition, but it all starts with good, healthy soil. And if you have, good soil, 90% of your other problems don't exist, okay? Now, I know none of you can respond to me, but <clears throat> I hope you all know what this is. This is a nice big hunk of good old red Georgia clay, which is pretty lousy stuff to plant a vegetable garden in. In the summer, it bakes as hard as a brick. In the winter, when it rains, it becomes goo. 
Uh, it holds water and really takes a long time to dry out. It doesn't want to release that water to your plants. So the plants have no place to put down roots because it's so, so dense. Uh, there's no oxygen in it because plants take in part of their oxygen that they need for growth through their roots. And that is, doesn't allow, this doesn't allow it. But it is good stuff in the fact that clay <clears throat> has a lot of minerals in it. A lot of this is pulverized rock. Uh, and those, that rock is sources of things like calcium, magnesium, boron, chromium, aluminum, and a whole bunch of trace elements that your, your plants really need to be good and healthy, but they can't get out of this, okay? <clears throat> so there's a secret to this. And here's the secret. <clears throat> this is compost. This is nothing more than rotted organic matter that you put in a big pile and you let it rot, okay? Think and and or compost is basically lousy stuff in its own right. Also, it has no very little nutrition nutritional value in here. As fertilizer, it's probably one of the worst. But what this organic matter is is compost. Is this is food for microbes, and there's thousands upon thousands of little microbes that live in this, and they eat it. Okay, <clears throat> two important things for that. One, those microbes allow this to be consumed and in consuming it, they release some of the minerals that are in here. But secondly, and more important, when those microbes eat, they release very mild acids in their waste products. And those acids slowly break down this thing. And what happens is when that acid hits the, the rock in here and the hard minerals in here, with a little bit of water, it all goes into an ion solution. So all those metals become ions. And ions are basically little tiny atoms of these things that are in water. And that the plants can take up very easily because it's liquid. Okay, So this, not so good by itself. This, not so good by itself. You put them together, you get great soil. <clears throat> And great soil is about 50% minerals, about 25% air, about 20% water, and about 10% or 5% organic matter, which is the compost I just showed you. Okay. When you have that combination, you have lots of water that can be taken up very readily by plants. It's not held by the, by the uh, clay. You have a lot of air in your soil because it's very loose. Uh, and that air can get into the plants through its roots. Um, you have a good mix of um, minerals <clears throat> and you have the right pH, which is acid or mineral or acid or base uh, condition of the soil, the water in that soil that allows those plants to pick up maximum amounts of nutrients. Good soil, definitely the key. Spend more time working about working your soil and worrying about your soil than you do wor worrying about anything else, and you'll have a very good garden. Good soil creates healthy plants. There's no there's no two ways about it. They get what they need. They grow strong. They have a lot of nutrition in them. If they are attacked by bugs, they have the strength to take those bugs and fight them off. And so little tiny infestations do not become major infestations where you may even have to rip out your whole garden and start all over again. Uh, <clears throat> the other part of sustainable gardening is to have a diverse environment or a whole garden of one thing, or you don't want to have an entire field of one thing. Now, we're not talking about commercial gardening or <clears throat> industrial farming. We're talking about your, your, your garden at home. But the more you can make that diverse, and by that we mean bringing in uh, pests that will eat, or bringing in bugs that will eat your pests, bringing in birds that will eat the bugs, uh, having water there, uh, having uh, a different mix of plants. The, the more diverse it is, the more it's similar to a natural environment and the healthier all the plants will be. It's kind of like a symbiotic relationship. And in doing that, <clears throat> By having all that natural, those natural elements, you can minimize the amount of chemicals you need, pesticides that you need, and all of these things um, live in a balance. And yes, you, you lose a little bit 
but you don't put all the he harsh chemicals on your property or things like that. So it is well worth um, <clears throat> the little extra effort it takes to do all that stuff. Okay, here is a um, slide about sustainable and um, conventional. Conventional is on the left, sustainable is on the right. Conventional, you really worry about the plants that you put in, a lot of GMO plants. You really want to get fertile, productive plants. Sustainable, you work on soil fertility. So good, healthy soil creates good, healthy plants and you get the nutrition and the, and the growth and the yield that you want because of good soil. Conventional, reactive, a lot of sprays, a lot of um, chemical additives. Sustainable is preventative. It takes a little bit of time to go out and look at your garden, see what's going on in your garden. You can minimize the invasiveness of pests by sometimes it's, it's, it's as simple as picking them off your plants. Um, conventional, lots of synthetic chemicals and pesticides. Sustainable biological pesticides and other options, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, sustainable, a lot more planning. Some loss is expected as opposed to lower risk loss conventional. And here's probably one of the biggest difference. When you do sustainable garden, you don't attack your soil with a rototiller regularly. You don't need to. Conventional gardening or industrial farming is a way they can get the, the plants in the ground, or the seeds into the ground uh, as fast as possible and get the best yield. When you tillage in your soil, let it stratify. What happens is the microbes that live in those soil layers have certain layers that they live in and they like living there. When you till it all up and you mix gardening so soil stays loose because you're working with, you don't need to um, till it. It's less expensive because you're not doing a lot of biological, I mean, a lot of expensive chemicals. Uh, needs a little bit of monitoring. Uh, what I do with my garden is that's where I do my cocktail hour. I take my drink that I had before dinner and I walk out into my garden and I look at things. I turn leaves over because a lot of times the bugs bottom side of the leaf. So you can see what you're getting. If you do that, you can look and see if anything's eating your plants. You can look and see if they're losing any leaves. You can look and see if you have any bugs that are coming in from other places. Uh, and it's, it's the old adage that a stitch in time saves nine. If you see it early, you can treat it early. The treatment is very small by comparison to a major outbreak. Uh, it, it doesn't shock your plants as much uh, and then Basically, everything stays in harmony and you get a lot better yield out of your garden. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about cool season. If you are in Georgia or the southeast, the fall is the best time to be a vegetable gardener. You don't have the heat. You don't have the need to water as much because the heat isn't sucking the, the water out of your soil. You don't have the bug load, the pest load that you have during the middle of the summer when bugs are a lot more active. Um, you have better soil temperatures because the sun is not baking your soil and raising the temperature up so high that actually the roots stop growing. Um, basically, fall gardening is it's a delight to be out in the garden. And all of the things that you go to the supermarket to buy, the expensive leafy green things, grow wonderfully in Georgia in the fall and throughout the winter. Um, and we'll talk about some of those in a little bit, but things like cabbage, kale, collards, beets, broccoli, uh, leeks, uh, there's five or six more. They are wonderful in the fall because they love the warm sun and the cool nights and they do very, very well here. Most of them will tolerate some. So if we get an early frost, uh, that makes better, collards better if they have a light frost because it brings out the sugar in it. And the um, one 
problem you have is that most fall vegetables are shallow rooted. So you have to watch the soil and the moisture level. You don't need to water as often, but you do need to water fairly to get the water down uh, through the, the shallow root layer that you have. Unlike warm season vegetables, cool season vegetables will tolerate frost, warm season don't. You need to have warm soil and warm uh, air temperatures and warm season vegetables will not tolerate any frost whatever. If they get a light dusting of, of frost, uh, most basically all of them die. Okay, uh, But personally, I love fall gardening because it's just a lot nicer to be out in the garden and not sweat to death and be attacked by bugs. Okay, You can see on this slide that there are different frost hardiness uh, are pretty much all the stuff that you plant during the summer. And you can run through that and you can see that, that all of those are basically hot weather plants. They need a lot of sun. They need a lot of warm temperatures, both for the soil and for the air to really fruit up and be a good, uh, a good yielding crop. The ones in the middle will tolerate some light frost. Um, and you can see Beets, cauliflower, celery chard, cabbage, lettuce, those are all basically leaf vegetables. Um, the other ones <clears throat> are root vegetables and the tops luckily don't get damaged too badly by a light frost. The ones on the right will take a hard frost and these again are very strong leafy vegetables and you can run down that list and I think except for turnips, well, actually turnips would have been included. Most of those you eat, uh, <clears throat> the leaves, not, not the, the root. Um, <clears throat> turnips, you can eat both. Radishes, you only eat the, the root. Uh, onion, you only eat the root. But <clears throat> these things thrive because they're mainly leaves and the leaves love the, the warm sun, the cool nights, and they make a lot of sugar and they make they, a lot of taste goes into those vegetables. So these you put in late fall or early spring. And most of them here in Metro Atlanta will go right through the winter. Um, even a, a frost, even a hard frost <clears throat> with a little bit of precaution will not damage them very much. And all of these on um, the hardy vegetables, you can get those as um, seedlings from most of the big box stores or any good nursery. And you can set them right out in your uh, <clears throat> this slide is specific to uh, some greens that bolt and bolting is a condition where a plant says, oh, this is warm and I, I better get busy making some seeds because it's going to be the end of the, the good season to be making seeds. I won't have enough energy. So the <clears throat> plant puts up a real spurt of growth and you can see that lettuce a plant in the middle, there's a big tall stem that's come up out of the top of it. <clears throat> What's happening there is the plant is throwing all of its energy into producing seed, which are on those little tiny sprouts at the top. And the sugars that used to make the lettuce leaves so tasty are being diverted. And what happens is less sugar, they become more of a bitter taste and you start getting seed. Well, if you're growing the vegetable for its leaves, you don't want that. Um, <clears throat> this is basically a response to hot weather. So by planting all of these greens in the fall, you don't get bolting and you get wonderful crops and you can harvest those crops all throughout the winter. Um, and they are, so this, this is basically eliminated by fall vegetable gardening. Okay. <clears throat> How do you get ready for the fall? Well, basically you want to have a clean, garden because any kind of plant debris can harbor uh, viruses or bacteria that can infect your plants. So you want to clean that all out. If you know stuff that is act act actually has symptoms of disease, you want to throw it in your garbage and get it off your site. You don't want to compost it. You don't want to bury it back into the, into the ground. Um, if, you, if you have a really good idea that it has disease, just put it in your regular household garbage and, and let, let it go to the dump. If it is not, you can chop it all up. You can put it into a compost 
in. If you want to, you can actually dig a couple holes and put that litter back under six or eight inches of soil. Uh, and then it will um, rot in there and help increase the or ma organic matter in your gardens. <clears throat> If you have compost or if you need to buy soil conditioners, you wanna add that at this point, a uh, couple inches, three or four, if you have it on a new bed, you wanna remove all the rocks and sticks so it's, you can get the soil very loose. And what's gonna happen are, are two things. All that organic matter is gonna rot and it's gonna release all the minerals that your plants are gonna need. And as it rots, all the microbes are gonna eat it, all of the earthworms are gonna eat it and the earthworms are going to give you a worm castings, which are incredibly good uh, fertilizer. The microbes are going to give you those, those ions of minerals and metals in suspension. And the um, earthworms are going to turn that bed over and it's going to get looser and looser and looser. I have beds that I have put down three years ago. And these are raised beds, I don't walk in them, but I can take my hand and just stick it down like that, like it was a, like it was a little shovel or a trowel and stick my hand down six or eight inches because the soil is so loose and, and crumbly and wonderful. So this is why you wanna have organic matter. Uh, and after a while, you really don't need to uh, till it because it's gonna be loose. All you do is plant your plants in it. Okay. <clears throat> If you are going to be having a vegetable garden where you're trying to get a fair amount of food out of a small area, you have to fertilize it. You know, when you have a, a what they used to call a cottage garden or a kitchen garden, <clears throat> people used to have gardens that were 100 by 200 feet. They'd have three feet between the rows. They run a tiller up and down between those rows to keep the weeds out or hoe it. There was plenty of soil there to get the minerals from that the plants needed. If you're <clears throat> doing this in a small raised bed or a small garden in the back of your suburban house, you won't have that kind of area. So you do need to have fertilizer. Um, organic fertilizer is a lot of weight for what you get. Commercial fertilizer is a lot of nutrients for the weight. So it one's not better than the other, they're just different <clears throat> and it just depends what you want to do. You can see on this list that there are very heavy feeders that will need a lot of fertilizer, medium feeders that don't necessarily need a lot of fertilizer, and light feeders. I do a lot of I do a lot of composting because I have the room and I try to build my soil. <clears throat> but I'll also give you a tip that I have done. If any of you are like my wife, she goes to garage sales and she loves garage sales. I will guarantee you. In the back of the garage at that garage sale, there's a half bag of fertilizer that they're happy to get rid of, but they didn't think about selling. Now, a brand new bag of fertilizer, 25 pounds, will probably cost you about $16 in the store. You can get that half bag of fertilizer for three bucks. So you can use it liberally because it's cheap and um, it, you don't need a lot, uh, just a handful or two on a four by eight bed, and that'll set you up for for all of these different feeders that you have here. Uh, and then do it before you plant, uh, when the stuff, when your plants come up and they're a couple inches high, maybe do a little bit more. And just before they're gonna start uh, yielding fruit, maybe just do a little bit more after that. Okay. When you plant your garden? Well, in the fall, it's kind of a, a mathematical game. <clears throat> in Northern Georgia and, and Metro Atlanta, the average first frost date is November 10th. So you back up from there the number of days that your plant needs to take to go to maturity uh, <clears throat> and then add the days for the harvest and then the germination time, which is usually a week or two if you're going to be planting seeds. And that's when you want to put it in. Okay. So you can see here that that backs some of these up until the first week or two of September or the last week of August. Um, right now, basically for everything, it's a great time to get it in the ground. Uh, September 15th is you know, pretty much right at the end and all these things will do well. Uh, you can put in your transplants right now if you don't, didn't raise them from seed. Uh, you can get your, your onion sets, you can get garlic and you can all put it in right now. So it's, it, it'll be really 
taking off while we have these warm days and cool nights. There's a whole bunch of different ways to plant a garden. Uh, if you have a small garden and you're not going to be planting too much of any one thing, you might want to just go and get seedlings from, you know, the Home Depot or Lowe's or any, you know, big um, nursery. If you're going to be using seeds, uh, that takes a little bit more work. Uh, you have to read what they say on the packaging for depth and for spacing. Um, Small seeds are very, very hard to um, broadcast or to put into a row. So the suggestion here is to mix them with sand or use a spice shaker and shake them out real slowly because otherwise they all go out real quick. Um, wet your soil down in case it's, the soil is dry so they get a good shot at germinating. And then you wanna keep them moist until they actually sprout and come up through the soil. Uh, you don't need to soak it, but you need to keep it moist. And <clears throat> if you have, uh, seedlings, you basically put them in the ground so that the, the depth of the soil on, on the seedling uh, pot is the same. It meets the depth of the soil in your garden. You don't want to put them too deep or too shallow because then they, it, it affects the roots. Thinning, um, you can see there that guy's got a whole row of carrots and he's trying to thin them out to one or one or two inches apart, that's set on your seed package. Um, <clears throat> there is an option to this. There's something called intensive gardening where you, you broadcast all the seeds in an area that's a square or rectangle. You don't plant them in rows. That requires a lot of fertilizer. Uh, the good news is though, they, they kind of thin out themselves. As they grow, they overshadow all of the weeds. So it keeps your weeds down, but it's, it takes a lot more attention and a lot more frequent watering because you have your plants crowded in a lot less space. Uh, the French have done this in raised beds for years. They're masters at it, uh, and they get some very good yields out of this. Okay, here's a little slide that is important to talk about because if you're gonna go get seedlings uh, to get your garden started earlier, if you look at that picture on the upper uh, right-hand side of your screen, you'll see two different pots. The one on the left has a lot of roots. They're brown. The one on the right has fewer roots and they're silver or gray or white. I'm not sure how, what you're seeing. The one on the left probably has some disease because the roots should not be brown. So you don't want to buy that, that pot. You want to buy the one on the right. The one on the right has had good root growth, but it's not too, it's not too dense. The roots are healthy looking, they're white or silver or gray. Um, and when you do buy seedlings, take it and pop it out of the, um, of the, the tray or, or the little pot that it's in it and look at these roots to see how they look, okay? You don't want the one on the left and you also don't want the one on the bottom. The one on the bottom is called root bound. It's been in that pot so long that the roots have run in a circle around the periphery of the inside of the pot, and that, that will never grow well in the soil. So you don't want that one either. You want ones that are like the plants that are in the upper right of your screen. Uh, the ones on the bottom, they say you can tease the roots out. You can cut them and spread them out, <clears throat> kind of like popping an umbrella open. Um, but that's a lot of work if you've got a lot of plants to do. So it's just better to look for ones that, that aren't there. With all of these, um, you want to try to put them in moist ground. So either water them or water the soil you're putting them into so they don't dry out when you transplant them. Because when pots or seedlings are transplanted, they do get shocked a little bit. And you want to minimize that shock as, as much as you can. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Once you've got your, your garden in, assuming you're gardening in rows, mulch is a very, very good friend of yours. Uh, mulch is basically organic material that you put on the ground that does several things. It helps you conserve moisture because the sun doesn't hit the ground directly and start cooking the moisture out of it. It, sh it shades out the weeds or the weeds can't go through it, uh, so they die. Um, it moderates the soil temperature, which is less important in the fall than it is in the summer. But soil, I mean, 
plants don't like really cold soil and they really, really don't like really hot soil. So by keeping the soil temperature more moderate, you get better growth in your plants and you get healthier plants that will yield more uh, produce for you. Several <clears throat> key elements, you wanna put down two to four inches of mulch. It'll, it'll shrink a little bit once it hits water or it gets rained on and it'll form a nice dense barrier. You wanna keep it away from right along the, the crown of your plant where the, where the uh, stems or the green starts coming up from the root. If you get that area, uh, the mulch around it, it'll stay moist and that'll prevent mold and mildew. I mean, it'll, and it'll encourage mold and mildew and you don't wanna do that. You wanna keep those plants nice and healthy. So keep it several inches away from the, from the crown of the plants. <clears throat> We mentioned earlier fall vegetables, they have shallow roots. So you need to water frequently. You still wanna water you know, somewhat deep to get down through the root zone of the plant. And you wanna make that you have enough mulch on there so you don't have to water. You don't have to waste water by having it evaporate on your soil. You wanna keep that water down in the soil. Uh, <clears throat> mulch also really cuts down on the weeds. But if you do have weeds that pop through, you want to take them out very lightly, especially when these seed leaves are very small because you don't want to injure the roots. <clears throat> what I do for mulch is I take all of the paper that is in my um, office and I shred it. Uh, I don't use the coated paper with magazine stock, but just the you know kind of photocopy paper and all the envelopes and things that I get <clears throat> and I shred it. And a couple of things there, number one, it's very light, so I put a lot down and it'll, it'll pack down to maybe a two inch, looks like a sponge. Number two, it's white, so it reflects the sun back up off the ground up into the underside of the plants, which makes them grow faster. Uh, and number three, it rots out real fast. So the more I put in there, the more it rots out and it really improves my soil. <clears throat> Some people use plastic mulch. Uh, they use plastic sheets, they use, um, uh, like plastic chips. I don't like plastic, so I don't use it. I can't say that there's anything bad with it. I just don't know. But if, I, if I'm gonna put mulch down, I want it to be organic so it helps grow my soil and it helps me to keep the, uh, the plants healthy. Okay. Here's a couple of things you can use for mulch. Compost, <clears throat> which is something I showed you earlier. Kind of looks like soil. It's basically just wadded organic matter. Uh, what I do is I take my clippings from all of my shrubs. I take my peelings from the kitchen. I take all of my grass clippings, all of my leaves in the fall, and I put them in a big bin that I make out of used pallets that are four, four foot pallets. So I have a bin that's four foot by four foot by four foot high. I put it all in there, I wet it down, I throw a couple of handfuls of fertilizer on it to make sure it has enough nitrogen, and I just let it rot. I mean, and you can do more than that. You can till it, you can turn it over, <clears throat> but you don't need to, it'll rot. And when it gets down to be mostly rotted, then you can make uh, mulch out of it. And if, you know, if it has some sticks and things that haven't rotted, that's fine. You, you put that on the top, it's, a, it's mulch and it works. Pine straw is something some people use. It looks, makes your garden look pretty. Um, I don't like it because it's expensive and I'd rather use stuff I have for free. Uh, it's also good if you have a lot of water in, in that area because it doesn't get very soggy. Um, they say it's good for acid loving plants, but I've never really noticed the difference in my garden because when it rots out, it it's, doesn't have a very uh, great effect on the pH or acidity of your soil. These <clears throat> are something that I use a lot of and my neighbors think I'm crazy because I drive around my neighborhood about a month from now and they put all their leaves in those nice big brown paper bags and I pick them up and I throw them in my truck and I take them home and I put them in my compost pile. Um, <clears throat> they're free. What I do is I grind them up with my lawnmower so they rot out faster for compost. Um, you have to mix it with um, enough stuff so it doesn't get too soggy and stinks when you're composting it, but you can put them right onto your right onto your garden as compost <clears throat> and they are fine. Shred it, mix it with straw, whatever you want to do. Uh, you can buy bark, <clears throat> excuse me. Again, I'm not a fan of paying for stuff I don't need to use. Bark is good. Uh, it lasts a long time as it rots. It really does a, 
in, impact your soil. It builds it up very well. Um, it does take nitrogen out of your soil when it decomposes. So if you're going to use bark, put a little 10, 10, 10 fertilizer into it and mix it. So there's available nitrogen that's not taken away from your plants. And if you have a free source of bark, it's great. Uh, if you have to pay for it, it's eight or ten dollars a bag and gets pretty expensive. Okay, coffee grounds. I call, I drink coffee. I make it by the pot, and coffee grounds are wonderful. Put them down very loosely. I don't don't take them, but earthworms love coffee grounds. You can put them on your soil on Monday and probably by Thursday they're not there because the worms will have come up and eaten them and taken them back down into the soil. Uh, they're really good to add texture to your soil for breaking up um, a lot of um, clay. Newspaper, kind of like what I said with my stuff from my, my um, study, I, I grind mine up or I shred it rather. Uh, it works very well. Um, if you wanna keep weeds out, you can take newspaper, four or five sheets of it, wet it, lay it down on the ground and cover it with some, some uh, mulch or some uh, top dressing to make it look nice and it'll keep the weeds from going through until it rots. Uh, it usually lasts one year. So whatever those weed seeds are, won't get through that. And then it rots out and becomes part of your soil. Um, one thing I don't use, and I learned this by uh, trial and error, is I don't use straw or hay because it has a lot of weed seed in it and it really increases the weed load in your garden and you spend a lot of time weeding. So I would not use straw or hay in, if I had any of the other ones. Um, but if you're gonna get a hard frost, <clears throat> straw and hay are very good because it, you bulk it up and it gives a, a it's like insulation. It gives you a, um, a trapped air layer next to the ground. So your, your plants won't get as damaged if you, use, if you cover them with straw or hay. But as soon as the frost is gone, you have to remove it from the top of your plants. Otherwise, um, you'll basically choke them out. But that's one very good use for it. Okay. Here are some other options. Uh, I don't use any of these, uh, but you can see there are things that you can do. Polyethylene film, if you are further in the north and you want to get a, a, a head start on your garden, you can put it down because it will help get the soil warm. And <clears throat> some plants, if you plant them in cold soil, basically they don't grow. And once the soil warms up, they will not grow. Once their roots have gotten shocked, they pretty much stop. Um, peanut shells, that is a major component of stuff that is sold as soil conditioner. Um, raw shells, I wouldn't put on my garden, but if it's soil conditioner, whether it's been partly decomposted, it's, it's not bad stuff, actually. It's, I think it's pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> Here are some of the various families of, of plants. And we have this, this slide in here because one of the things that happens is that bugs are very smart and they find the plant that they like the most, that's their favorite food. And if you keep planting it in the same place, those bugs <clears throat> show up in the same place year after year. And as the bug load goes up, your you know, yield goes down. So one of the simplest thing to do is just plant it in a different spot. So you confuse the bugs and they have to take a long time to find it. And then by that time, you've gotten a decent crop out of it and you have um, um, achieved your goal, which is have a decent garden. Some of these also <clears throat> will encourage nematodes in the soil, um, which are very hard to get rid of. These are you know, uh, pests that live in the soil. So by moving them around, you minimize the nematode load in your garden. Um, now, this is very hard to do in a small garden. If your garden's 10 by 10, you can move it three or four feet, but you can't move it 100 feet or 50 feet. Um, so just try to move things around as best you can. Um, and we probably have most of these in a small garden. So just make it in five or six zones. If you have two or three or four raised beds and just move them around. Um, it's not critical, but it does help. And you can see that some of these have, some of these families have a whole bunch of different crops. So you wanna make sure when you're looking at these things and moving them around, you understand which part they are in. 
and this is still this is online, so you will, you can always come back and refer to this. Okay, <clears throat> here is a bunch of things that, as a gardener, you need to be aware of to have a healthy garden that gives you a good yield and helps build the soil and helps build the nature around it. Soil fertility and pH. pH is basically the acid level in your soil. And plants only absorb ions, those metal ions that we were talking about earlier in a certain range of acid. Too much, too little, they don't take them in. <clears throat> so your soil needs to have a good pH and you can get that tested. You can get your soil tested to see if it has the right amount of nutrients in it. Uh, the state of Georgia has something called the Cooperative Extension Service, which has labs that are part of the University of Georgia. You can go to a Cooperative Extension office, you can get a soil bag, they tell you how to test your soil. Uh, I think for $14, they will send you a three page report on what your soil is. And if you have told them what you want to grow, they will tell you what you need to do to that soil to make it the best you can have in order to raise the crop that you want to raise. Uh, that could be vegetables, it could be flowers, it could be ornamental trees, it could be you know things like wheat, you know, peanuts, uh, soybeans, you know, whatever it is, they can tell you what it is. And they collect samples from all over the state of Georgia by the tens of thousands. And they have a data bank that they always look at when they make these uh, reports to you. So you're getting a lot of information. Now, <clears throat> one thing, I get as questions is why can't I just go to the nursery and get the soil pH testing kit? Well, that's sort of the difference between a motion picture and a snapshot. The kit that you get at the nursery that you do yourself just tells you this is a pH of your soil right now, okay? It doesn't tell you what you need to do to change the pH or how much of that that you need to do to get that pH to stay in the range where it needs to be so you have good healthy plants. When you get a pH test and a soil test from the University of Georgia, they do something called a, an ion, um, I can't think of the name, but basically what they do though, it's like it's, it's test to failure. They keep take, they take that, set, that specimen of soil and they change it and they change it and they add things to it until this, the pH of that sample gets stable right where they want to do it. And then they figure out what they do to it what they did to it. And they say, okay, for you to do this for your whole garden, you need to add so much of this and so much of this every hundred feet or so much of this and so much of this every row. And what that says is if you do all this, you go from the start of the movie all the way to the end of the movie. It's not just a snapshot. <clears throat> so you get to the end and you know what the end is going to be. And the end is where you want it to be. So I would strongly encourage you if you live in Georgia, that you get a, a test, uh, soil test from the Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, if you live in other states where they have it, do the same, call your Cooperative Extension office there and they will tell you what you need to do to get a soil test. If you're just starting out in the garden, it's well worth the $14 because you will save a lot, two or three seasons of, of uh, I won't say failure, but miserable results or un unhappy results because your soil is not the right for growing your plants. Uh, Water, temperature, we already talked about. Crop rotation, we talked about. Sanitation is, is several things. One, it's taking diseased plants, or taking diseased leaves off your plants when you see them, picking up diseased plants that have fallen onto the ground to prevent the disease from getting into the soil. It is spacing your plants properly so they have enough air around them so you don't get problems with mold and mildew. Um, I used to volunteer at a community garden and they sold four foot by 10 foot plots that you could garden in. And in the spring, you would see these lovely layouts of 20 little tiny tomato plants in, a, in a, two rows in a 10 foot bed. So there was 10 in that row and 10 in this row. Well, that's one every foot. Tomato plants really to get the air that they need and the air circulation they need, they need to be planted probably one every three feet. And what happens in a month or two months are those tomato plants <clears throat> grow and they intertwine, intertwine themselves like vines in a jungle. Uh, they're full of disease because there's no airflow to keep the, uh, the plants healthy and you have to rip it all out and throw it away. 
So sanitation also involves proper spacing for your plants, um, picking up the stuff that is uh, diseased or just in general trash. And if it's not diseased, compost it. There are in just about every state plant varieties that have been grown just for your state and just for the diseases that are most prevalent there. I can't imagine any of any nursery or any other big box stores selling you stuff that is not what they need to sell sell you for this this area. Uh, they, they have too many to come being taken back. They wouldn't make any money. So this is generally something that you don't need to worry about if you're buying seedlings. We talked about mulching. We talked about watering. Again, watering, you want to get the water down into the root layer. You want to do it so it soaks all the way down in the fall. You want to do it fairly regularly so the, the shallow root layer does not dry out. Uh, but these are, these are very simple cultural controls that you as a gardener totally uh, have within your power to adjust and to make sure that they're perfect. Okay. Physical controls. If you have situations where you do have pest loads, again, this is mostly in the summer, uh, not so much in the fall. There are a whole bunch of things you can do to minimize <clears throat> pest interaction with your plants. What the picture you have there is a row cover. <clears throat> that is a non-woven cloth set up on a, on a set of hoops. And it's basically like a big tunnel that covers your plants and the, and the bugs just not get through their eggs on the plants or eat the leaves or whatever they want to do. That is That cover is 100% permeable to water. It's about 85% permeable to sunlight. So it does not affect your plants uh, for the amount of time that it has to be on there. Um, if, if, you do, if you do things where uh, you have a critical season, um, you put those grow covers on for the season and then you take them off. An example would be summer squash. When the squash are blooming, um, you have to take that off so the bees can get in and pollinate the flowers, but then you put it back on so the, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the vine borers, the squash vine borers don't get into the vines and suck out all the sap and basically kill your plant. Uh, and <clears throat> they stay under that row for quite a while and they do a very, very good job, uh, you know, keeping the bugs out. Hand picking is, is, again, that's something you can do when you go out and look at your garden. If any of you have chickens and you plant cabbage, the cabbage will get these big, long um, cabbage loopers. They're, they're worms. They're about the size of your pinky. Pick off and feed them to your chickens, and they will love you forever because they love them. They're all full of nice, good fat. Um, you can do traps, lures. Um, those can be something as simple as uh, planting different flowers or different crops on for far enough away from the crops you're trying to harvest that it draws the bugs there. In the summer, you can basically cook um, your soil to get stuff out of it by putting a piece of clear plastic over it and just cooking the soil up to high temperatures, which kills all the, the bugs in it. Uh, you can freeze it in the wintertime. <clears throat> and that'll kill the bugs. You can do fencing in case you have problems with deer, with squirrels, with uh, chipmunks, with rabbits. Uh, neighbors, <laughs> uh, but all get, these things, again, are very easy to take care of. <clears throat> he, here's where you really get into the heart of organic or, and or sustainable gardening. The whole idea is to let nature balance itself out. You don't want to use a lot of in, in chemical pesticides, insecticides, because that basically is indiscriminate and it kills everything, it kills the good bugs and the bad bugs. <clears throat> What you try to do is attract the beneficial bugs that, that eat or kill the bad bugs, and then they don't bother your crops because they eat the bugs. For example, when I was a kid, my dad, who's probably one of the original organic gardeners, he would pay us a dollar to go out and buy or to get uh, praying mantis egg cocoons. Um, you'd find them everywhere back then. And a praying mantis egg cocoon looks like a tan golf ball. It's about that big. It has little, little dimples on it like a golf ball does. And when you put that cocoon or, or egg sack in your garden, when that thing breaks open, about 300 little tiny praying mantis come out of it and they eat all the bugs in your garden. 
And then when they run out of bugs, they eat each other. And then when they're gotten down to the last one, that's the one who makes the babies and the eggs for the next generation. So <clears throat> you can buy them online. You can release them in your garden. Uh, you can get it, you can get uh, ladybugs, uh, which are very good to eat aphids, and then they'll fly away when there's no more food. They won't attack your plants. Um, you can do uh, things that will attract insects like plant flowers that are good for pollinators. Zinnias are an excellent example. Zinnias are the easiest plants to grow. We basically throw the seed on the ground, cover it with a little bit of soil, it'll grow. They're nice and bright. They're cheerful. They bring in lots of pollinators. The pollinators bring in the, uh, the um, birds, which will keep the insect under control. Uh, <clears throat> and then those pollinators will eat all, a lot of the other bugs that are, are harmful to you. All this basically works with nature. You don't put any pesticide down on your, um, on your garden. Chemical controls are really the last, last thing. Um, and if you do all this other stuff right, you really don't need them. Here's some examples of, of pests. Um, this is, this, these are aphids. A picture shows the underside of a leaf. Um, they live on the underside of the leaf. They basically they eat your plants. Uh, they leave this sticky, um, sweet uh, byproduct, and that attracts ants. And if you have uh, carpenter ants, they may eat your plants as well. It's easy enough just to take a water spray from a hose and just knock them off. Once they hit the ground, they don't get back on your plants. I don't know why, but they don't. If you have a really bad infestation, like the picture, you can just pop that leaf off with your thumb and your finger, pinch it off, and just throw it in a bucket of soapy water, and they'll all die. Uh, how do you prevent them? Don't over fertilize, use row covers, bring in the lady beetles that we talked about, or you can spray them with insecticidal soap. <clears throat> insecticidal soap is basically liquid laundry detergent. Take so whatever laundry, I mean, dishwashing detergent, I'm sorry. Take whatever dishwashing detergent you use, put a good squeeze into a um, little sprayer, put a gallon of water in it, shake it up real good, just spray your plants. And what the soap does is it, it coats the, the aphids and they can't breathe well, so they have to move. And when they try to move, they fall off the plant and then they don't bother your plants anymore. Very simple to use insecticidal soap. You don't have to buy the fancy stuff. Dishwashing liquid does it just fine. Here are cabbage loopers. These are the things I told you the chickens love so much. <clears throat> that top photograph, that, that worm is about inch and a half, two inches long. And they're very well camouflaged, but you can see them. You can see the green is almost identical to the green of the leaf behind it, which is a cabbage leaf. Um, they love all the cold crops. So cabbage, uh, kale, collards, all those things, they love them. The way you know you have them is you see the little holes in the leaves like you've seen in the middle photograph and look for them and you'll find them on the leaves. Just, you can just pick them off. You can either throw them in a, a pail of soapy water, feed them chickens, um, whatever you want. You can squash them. <clears throat> there is a biological control called BT, which is Bacillus, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a powder you mix with water. Um, you spray it on the plants. And what that does is when they eat the plants, the cabbage loopers get this into their digestive system, which destroys their digestive system. So they, they won't eat your plants anymore. They just go away and they die. Um, and what these cabbage loopers do is they make these little nice cabbage moths on the lower picture and that turns a cycle, you know, starts the cycle again. So very easy to control. <clears throat> comment about um, chemicals. You can see there are three caution words here. Caution, warning, danger. My son-in-law does pesticide research <clears throat> for a living and he deals with the dangerous stuff, the highly toxic stuff. Just to give you an idea, he wears a Tyvek suit, including his head, there's a hood. He tapes his wrist and his ankles, so nothing can get in there. He wears gloves, rubber gloves on his hands, and he puts on booties for his feet, and he, he sprays what he has to spray. <clears throat> he cleans up his equipment. He strips off all of that stuff. Oh, also, he wears a full mouth, a full face respirator, covers his whole face. He takes the respirator off. That's the only thing he saves. 
Everything else he takes off, he throws into a, into a um, biohazard disposal bag. They go and they burn it. He goes home and he has a washer dryer in his garage. He takes off all of his clothes and throws them in the washing machine and puts on his bathrobe and goes into the house. He does not allow anything that he's worn in the field to come into his house because these things can be very, very dangerous. And <clears throat> if I can say one thing or two things, read the directions. And if you're uncomfortable with what those directions say, don't use that pesticide. If it says wear full length clothing, wear full length clothing. If it says use a respirator, use a respirator. Follow directions. They test these things exhaustively to know what you need to do to be safe. And they're telling you what you need to do to be safe. So be safe. And the last thing here is more is not better. That's a, that's a traditional American thing. Oh, well, if they say use a gallon on an acre, I'll use five gallons. No, it'll kill you <clears throat> or it can kill you. And a lot of these things are cumulative in their toxicity. So if you do it wrong continually, you're hurting yourself even faster than if you had been doing it right. Okay, extending your season. In Atlanta, you can, you can garden right through the winter here. Uh, things will grow. All these greens we've talked about go right through the winter. You can use the row cover you've talked about, we, you see here. Um, you can put down, water them well. Water, when it comes out of the ground, has 60, is about 65 degrees. So if you put that on a 40 degree soil, you've warmed it up. And water has a tremendous amount of heat to carrying capacity. So if you water well, it'll prevent frost from settling into your plants uh, fairly significantly. Um, you can use row covers, the heavier ones protect more, the lighter ones protect less. But even if you use a very thin row cover, and by the way, you can buy these things online, you can get them from Tractor Supply or most of the seed catalogs have them. And it's, it's just big long sheets of, of non-woven material that are maybe six feet by a hundred feet. If you don't need all that much, they sell it in I think 25 and 50 foot lengths, or you can share it with a neighbor. All you have to do is put it over your plants. That's all you have to do. Um, there's other things called cloches, <clears throat> where you can take, basically, it's, they used to be glass, but you can take a clear plastic or a milky plastic milk jug, cut the bottom out on three sides, put it over your plant, take the flap, turn it up, and put a piece of rock on it so it doesn't blow away, use it to weight it down. It's like a mini greenhouse that already has a vent. Take the top off the cap and that'll protect them as well. Um, usually you don't need to do too much around, around Metro Atlanta. North of here, you might get a hard freeze on occasion, but we very seldom get them in Metro Atlanta. Okay, the end of the season, that's the same thing as you did at the beginning of the season. You um, wanna clean up debris, you wanna compost stuff if it's not diseased, you wanna add your organic matter, your, your compost or <clears throat> more, uh, mulch. If you are going to continue planting, uh, you know, put in a second crop of lettuce or another crop of onions or, or some other green thing, just plant it. If you're not, you might want to think about letting your soil relax for a couple of months and plant a cover crop. Uh, you can see them there. And what cro cover crops do is they increase the amount of nitrogen in your soil, so you need to use less fertilizer. Plus, when you turn them in, you're taking all that organic matter and you are making your soil looser and <clears throat> giving those microbes more food to eat. So cover crops are, are very good. Um, there's other ways to do it, but if you like cover crops, um, they, are, they are very efficient. And they also really increase the amount of nitrogen in your soils, especially clover. Clover is very good. Okay, end of season. You decided it's not, you're not, want to keep going through December, January, February, <clears throat> you can prepare a bed for peas which you plant late winter, early spring. Um, I don't know if you have, have ever raised sugar snap peas, but they are delicious. They have lots and lots of sweetness in them from the amount of sugar they have. I plant these at my uh, garden that I have at my church school, and I never get to harvest them because the kids, when they're walking by, they always pick them off because they know they don't use any pesticides on them, and they just love them. So I get maybe a handful out of a 50 foot rope, but I'm glad they're eating them because that's what I plan them for. Take care of your garden tools. Uh, if you have wood handles, you want to oil them with a good quality linseed oil. Uh, you want to get the um, rust off of them. A real easy way to clean your, your shovels and, and your spades is get a bucket of sand, uh, put a quart of motor oil in it, 
mix it up and then just take your <clears throat> shovel and just jam it up and down in the sand. And the sand will scrape the rust off and it will leave the oil and the oil prevent, will prevent it from rusting later on and the oil is not gonna hurt your plants. Uh, and then you can do the last thing in here, which is my nemesis. I start looking at seed catalogs and I realize that I wanna plant enough um, seeds for 200 by 200 garden in my 10 by 10 little plot that I have. So I have to not order about 90% of what I wanna plant. <clears throat> but that's why they send them to you. So you look at them and um, it's a good thing to order your seeds from somebody local because then you know the, the plants that raise those seeds were grown locally and you know they're gonna do well in your climate. Um, there, you can go online and you can find places that are within a state of two or where you are. <clears throat> and that's generally a good place to get your, your seeds from. Okay, we talked earlier about getting a pH or and a soil test. Um, this shows you how to do it. Uh, as I mentioned, it takes about, I think it's a $14 charge. You go to the cooperative extension office in your county and you can uh, get these bags and drop them off there. They will email you the results usually within two to three weeks, unless they're really busy like they are in March and April. So we'll get it done now if you can. Um, <clears throat> and basically it's gonna tell you not just where your soil is, but what your soil needs done to it to get it where you want it to go, where, where it's gonna be really good stuff for your, for your plants. Um, I do, I test my soil every two or three years and it changes enough that I have to adjust things. So well worth getting in the habit of doing this uh, for your garden, especially if you're just starting out. Oh, here we go, all the good stuff right here. So I basically just said that you change, you change your pH by either adding lime or sulfur uh, and they will tell you what to do. Uh, it's always good to use granular stuff, which takes effect over time. It doesn't shock the soil right away. It takes a fair amount of time. So if you do it in the winter, uh, you've got time to get this done for, for your spring and your summer gardens. Okay, questions. I think we've run to the to the end of the um, uh, time. So I'm open for any questions. I think we have quite a few and I will take as many as we have time for. So uh, how do we George, start off? Uh, we yes, have sir. A, a number of questions. Uh, let's first ask about uh, raised beds uh, versus uh, in the soil uh, preparation. Preparing a raised bed versus preparing uh, the garden in the soil. Okay. Um, I am a big fan of raised bed gardening. Mine are 16 inches high, so I can sit on the edge of them because 16 inches is the same height as the chair you're sitting in right now. It makes it a lot easier if you have bad knees or a bad back like I do. Um, <clears throat> the, the problem, well, the good things about raised beds is you don't walk in them. So your soil stays nice and loose. It's easy to weed, the weeds come right out. It's easy to plant in. When I plant seedlings, I don't use a trowel. I take my, my hand like that and I push it in the soil. I pull it back, I put my seedling in and I squish it back together. I have to clean my fingernails, but <clears throat> it's real easy, stays real loose. Um, so the soil stays loose, it's easy to weed. It takes water very well. The water goes way down deep so you can water efficiently. The problem with a raised bed is you need a lot of soil, okay? Well, if you're starting in the fall, <clears throat> there's kind of a workaround for that. If you build a raised bed and I make mine out of two by six pressure treated lumber, uh, four feet by eight feet, that's the size of my bed. You can make them bigger, smaller, whatever you want. Um, and I just put it on the ground. If you have any um, grass or anything there, what I do is I just put down a lot of newspaper, I wet it down, I take five or six pages and the sheets and I just, I just blanket the grass so it doesn't grow up. And then <clears throat> I go around and I pick up all those bags of, of leaves that I talked about earlier and I stick them down there in my raised bed and I walk on them and I pack them down as best I can till they're maybe six inches from the top. And then if I have soil some, somewhere else, I put the soil on top, about six inches worth of soil. If I don't, I go to the Lowe's or Home Depot or nursery or whatever, and I buy, buy soil and I put about four or five inches on top. 
you can plant in that layer of soil for the winter while the rest of the organic matter down below is rotting, okay? By the spring, that 16 inches is gonna go down about eight inches. So you got some pretty good soil there. And then turn it up with a shovel or a pitchfork or whatever, add some more soil. If you can find clay, add some clay. <clears throat> so you get the minerals in there and you can do that for two or three years and buy very little soil and then make great amount of soil in your raised bed. That to me is much easier than gardening in, in the soil at, at soil. Um, the with the soil <clears throat> you're going to have a lot of clay a lot of rock which means you have to till it or really bust it up with a shovel which is very hard work uh it's also hard to plant because you're bending over or you're on your knees uh it's harder to weed because the soil is denser so the roots have more purchase and you really have to pull them out or get down there with a, a weed fork and get the roots out and pull them out uh to, to me and i'm I, this is just my estimate Gardening in the soil is 10 times harder than gardening in a raised bed. Raised bed, you take a little more work up front, but what you get back is a lot less work down, down the road. Uh, if you don't have raised beds and you have to work in the soil, I would say buy yourself either a good tiller or rent one the first time round. Get yourself a lot of organic matter. Uh, if you can find some <clears throat> place you can get cow manure or horse manure, if you have a lot of leaves, put as much organic matter on that ground as you can and till it in and beat the tar out of that, you know, that ground. Uh, you're gonna disturb the microbes, but you have enough organic matter in there, they will reestablish themselves by next season. This year, your crop won't be, won't be as good as it could be, but it'll still be pretty good because you amended the soil. So I think raised beds are the way to go, myself. Okay, any Thank other you. questions? Uh, there uh, is regarding the mulch, you had mentioned mm -hmm. uh, using newspaper. Does the mm -hmm. type of ink make any difference? Well, what I would not take the the inserts that you have in a newspaper that are usually printed on glossy paper. Um, that 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 gloss is kaolin clay, which is really not that good for your soil. Uh, it doesn't really add anything, but it's just not good. Um, <clears throat> if you just take regular kind of grayish newspaper, just like you know the. the the contents of the paper printed on, and you either run it through a shredder or rip it up in little bits and bits or lay it down in sheets and put something else on top of it. That's what I use because that'll rot out fast and really add to the um, to the tilt of the soil, the looseness of the soil. In the, in the same regard, what about cardboard as a mulch? Cardboard as sheet mulch is very good. Uh, nothing goes through it. And in two years, it'll rot out <clears throat> what I, if I was using cardboard, if so, let's say you are planting your, your garden on, in rows and the rows are 16 inches apart, I would cut that cardboard in long strips, 14 inches wide. I'd lay it in there where you walk and put some rocks on it and just, just let it be. And it'll rot out fairly quick, probably get two seasons out of it and <clears throat> nothing will, nothing will grow through it. And it's, it's actually Pretty good, pretty good weed control and good mulch as well. Okay. Uh, one, one of the listeners has been successful with Irish Spring soap keeping the deer away. Would using Irish Spring soap uh, be beneficial in a vegetable garden or would it be harmful? Well, I don't know that it's effective. I, I think. Irish spring soap is one of those wives tales and I've heard people swear by it. And I've heard people say, oh my God, it doesn't do a thing. Okay. The only really good deterrent for deer is a physical fence. Now there are two ways to do a physical fence. You can <clears throat> get a 10 foot high barrier that the deer cannot jump over uh, and you can make that out of, of nylon webbing or netting rather, you can make it out of wood, you can make it out of chain link fence, but that's very expensive and it's very uh, <clears throat> time consuming to put up. There's something else called a, a deer maze and you can probably go online and get some examples of these. But what a deer maze is, is you outline your, your garden with um, maybe four foot high stakes and you take about 80 pound test monofilament fishing line 
and you make a loop up, up those stakes. So you make like three or four horizontal layers of fishing line. And then about four feet in, outside of that, you put up some two foot stakes and you go around those two foot stakes of the fishing line and then you go zigzag back to the four foot stake. So basically you're creating like a four foot wide zone that has invisible barriers in it. And what happens, and this is what we used to use up in New York where I'm from, <clears throat> is the deer hit that first two foot string with their feet and they don't know what it is. And since they don't know what it is, they don't know whether they can jump. Now a deer can, can jump over a 10 foot fence or an eight foot fence. But if they don't know that they can jump it, they don't jump. So <clears throat> just using a bunch of stakes and monofilament fishing line creates a deer maze, which will keep deer out of your garden. Now you have to be able to get through and you know have a way to get into your garden. I don't know if you want to go through a fence or make a gate or whatever, but it's pretty effective. And it takes a spool of monofilament fishing line that you can probably get for three or four dollars. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Is there such a thing as a shade vegetable garden? Or to say it another way, uh, is what is the minimal amount of sun needed for a patio veggie garden? Okay. <clears throat> Most vegetables, including the big leafy vegetables you grow in the fall, need eight hours if you can get it. Six, they'll probably bear. Uh, if you have a problem with shade in the summer, what I would do is I would look at your plot of land to see where you would not have shade in the winter. Once the leaves are falling off the trees, if you have deciduous trees, you can probably put in a fall vegetable garden and even a spring vegetable garden until the leaves bud out and start shading your plants. Um, if, you have cons if you have permanent shade, like on the north side of a building, uh, where, the, where the trees don't create the shade, the building does, and you can't do anything about the building, then no, if you get less than six hours, you're going to have a very uh, poor yield. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, though, if you have any sun anywhere, uh, you can make your, your vegetable garden in little tiny pieces. You can put, you know, all those things in between your, your flowers or between your shrubs. If you have a nice sunny flower garden or a nice sunny uh, shrub uh, area of lawn bed in, out in your lawn, put your vegetables in there. The added benefit of that is that when we have a drought, it is usually allowable to water your vegetable garden. And if your vegetable garden has to happens to be in little pieces right next to your flowers or your shrubs, if your flowers or your shrubs happen to get some leftover water that got mis misdirected, you're saving all of the very expensive landscaping you put in by watering that inadvertently. So <clears throat> that might be another tip is just break your garden up and put little pieces where the sun is if you have other sun in other areas in your lot. Okay, thank you again. Uh, if growing veggies by seeds, when should the soil be mulched? Uh, at the time of planting or when you start the seeds? Uh, once, they, once the seeds come up, they should, um, you, got, you want to have your seedlings two or three inches high before you get the mulch. Okay. Uh, does tobacco mosaic virus come from the soil and there be, therefore be recurrent unless the soil is replaced? We're talking about the uh, tobacco mosaic virus. Do you have to replace the soil? You know, I'm not sure the answer to that. I think the answer is yes, or you have to treat the soil with a, a drenching um, a chemical treatment. <clears throat> but I have to say, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. So yeah. I have to research that. And if they want to send that in on an email, I'll, re I'll, I'll research it and respond. All right. uh, caterpillars with yellow and black spots. Is there any way to remove them other than pulling them off by hand? You can use a spray with that Bacillus thuringiensis, the BT I talked about. That'll kill them. Uh, um, that's basically the only other thing I know. Cool. 
that, that's all the time we have, Michael, for, for questions. Okay. Um, uh, are, so, are, are these slides available anywhere? Yes, that there. Uh, everybody will get a follow up email. George is going to continue. Thank you. I just wanted to thank all our partners. You see this here in the slide. Some of the people that help us put on these Zoom meetings and our um, our partners with the technology. Uh, we we you know really owe a debt to these people because we can reach out during COVID and and still continue our mission of education. And we couldn't do it without them. And here is something that uh, <clears throat> shows you what's coming up in our other Zoom uh, and uh, online. There's a lot more that you can um, learn about and <clears throat> just uh, you have to sign up by going online and signing up, uh, but it's all free. And it's, I think hopefully uh, it's been, this one has been educational and I hope you find the other ones educational. So uh, thank you very much for, um, listening with us and uh, hope you've gotten something out of this for your fall vegetable garden.